Soil School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by The Mosaic Company. Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin. Welcome to the Soil School. Today, on our first episode for 2024, we're going to dig into how nutrients move in the soil. As we'll learn from our guest, University of Guelph researcher Dr. John Lozon, essential nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus move quite differently through the soil. And understanding how those nutrients move is key to helping growers choose the best application strategies. Here's John Lozon. So John, let's kick this off with a look at the mobility of nitrogen and phosphorus. You know, how do you compare their movement through the soil? Okay, before we start, I'd like to thank you for having me on. Uh, and I want it to be clear that what we're talking about here today is the movement to the root surface and not the uptake itself. When we look at that movement, all nutrients move in one of three ways, either by root interception, where the root grows and simply comes in contact, mass flow, where the plant is taking in water and the nutrient moves with it, or diffusion. If we look at the nutrients that you talked about, uh, some nutrients like nitrogen and sulfate move primarily by mass flow. So they are really high mobility nutrients, whereas phosphate, very low mobility. Now, John, when it comes to grain and oilseed production, the goal is to get nutrients into the plant and drive yield. Um, what role do corn and soybean roots play in intercepting N and P, for example? You talked about three ways. Let's talk a little bit about the roots. Okay, often the roots are unseen and so people don't worry about them too much. But really, if we're looking at that plant, that's the driver. That's the contact point between the soil and the plant, allowing for water and nutrient uptake. Clearly, having a bigger, robust root system is going to be better for nutrient uptake in each of those three ways, but really it's the diffusion that's going to have the biggest impact from a thicker uh, rooting system, and so it's going to have a bigger impact on phosphorus uptake than it will for something like nitrate. Let's talk about water. Obviously, we're always managing rain and rainfall and, uh, and water in the soil. You know, how does mass flow influence uptake of nutrients. You know, obviously, we talked about roots. Let's talk about mass flow. Okay, when we look at different plant nutrients, some of them exist almost entirely in the soil water. Nitrate, nitrogen, sulfate, almost entirely in the water. So when the plant is taking up that water, that nutrient moves along with. That means that nearly all of the uptake requirement of the plant can be attained simply by mass flow alone for those two. Phosphate, on the other hand, in the soil in its plant available form, forms something that we call precipitates. It forms a new compound with iron, aluminum, or calcium to form a calcium phosphate, for instance. In doing so, it essentially becomes part of the soil. Very little stays in the soil water, so mass flow brings to it a very, very small proportion of the total phosphorus requirement. Now let's talk about um, how far nitrogen and phosphorus can actually move over the course of a growing season. Because nitrate and sulfate, for instance, are almost entirely in the soil water, it can move a great distance. And the entire rooting zone is available for uptake uh, due to just mass flow alone of those nutrients. But when you're looking at phosphate, because it forms those precipitates, very little in the soil water, uh, so it's moving primarily by diffusion. Diffusion on its own is pretty sm uh, slow. But when you also incorporate that idea that phosphate is reacting with the soil, it slows it down even further. That means that over the entire growing season, phosphate may move no more than about a sixteenth of an inch, maybe an eighth of an inch in total. And so if you're looking at that rooting system, a root system for corn and soybean may occupy no more than maybe one percent of the total soil volume. And if we're only looking at one eighth of an inch at the most, maybe a sixteenth in most cases around that root, only a really small proportion of the total soil volume is, is explored in any given year for phosphorus. What about nitrogen? Nitrogen, on the other hand, uh, again, the entire rooting zone is explored. It moves inches, uh, if not even feet in some cases, depending on how much water is moving and how far it's moving. Mm. Now, um, how does that movement drive application strategy, um, John? You know, when it comes to slow moving phosphorus, for example, I'm assuming you know, banding would be an obvious strategy for growers. Yeah, of course, if you think about phosphorus, if we broadcast apply it, that really early growth plant is only seeing a really small, minute part of it. And when you've got a plant like corn that has a relatively high requirement for external phosphorus during that very early growth period, that's just not going to cut it. 
So having phosphorus applied either in the seed trench, which is going to be able to encounter the very first roots that enter that soil, or in a side band where some of the early roots might grow and happen to encounter it, is going to have a major uh, benefit in terms of meeting the phosphorus demand during that early growth cycle. John, for that seed place nutrient, you know, how close is too close? You know, what can happen if we get too close to that seed or too far away? Okay, when we're looking at seed place, we're right on top of the seed. Now the issue when we put a fertilizer on the seed or even close to the seed is the possibility for fertilizer injury, which is two different things. One is just a salt injury. When a seed germinates, it germinates because it contains a higher concentration of salts than the soil does around it. And that causes water to go into the seed by osmosis. When we add fertilizer nutrients, we're increasing the salt concentration. I don't mean the stuff we put on our french fries, I mean any ion and solution which fertilizer nutrients are. And in doing so, there's not that big of a gradient and water may not go into the seed, so it may not germinate or it may delay it. The other possible source of fertilizer injury is from urea application. When we apply urea fertilizer around that granule, two things happen. Yes, ammonium is released, but the pH also goes up a little bit. And that increase in pH can cause that ammonium to convert to ammonia. Now we use ammonia in toilet bowl cleaners because it kills respiring cells. That germinating seed has lots of respiring cells, so we can very easily kill it as well. And so when we're really close to the seed, seed placed very small amount, maybe 10 kilograms per hectare of N plus K can go on. And no urea at all. As we move further and further away from the seed, our rates can go up so that in a sideband we can go up quite a bit higher and have the same amount of safety. Uh, we can put on a little bit of urea as well. And so in terms of distance, really how far we are away dictates the chance of injury. The farther we are, the less chance, but the farther we are, the less chance of response too. We want to capture those very early roots. So going much more than two inches away and two inches below is probably too far. Now, John, how does phosphorus source influence the impact of this strategy? You know, how do growers best utilize MAP, for example? Okay, when we're looking at uh, fertilizer placed close to the seed, whether it's seed placed or in a side band, we're usually looking at a monomonium phosphate, MAP, or a lot of the liquids would fit into the same category. And we're using that ammonium with the phosphate for a very specific reason. Yes, it meets part of the need for nitrogen during early growth, but in addition to that, when a plant takes up ammonium, it will release a hydrogen at the same time. That release of the hydrogen decreases the pH a little bit around the root surface. That decrease in pH can change the form of plant available phosphate to a form that's slightly more mobile resulting in maybe not a sixteenth of an inch, but maybe up to an eighth of an inch of that desorption zone, greatly increasing the amount of phosphorus that's totally available. John, let's finish this up with a look at nitrogen. Um, you know, how does that faster movement through soil impact our nitrogen application strategy? Okay, so the need for band placement is not as great. Yes, we would like to have a little bit for the reasons that I talked about and to meet some of the early need requirement of the plant. But in general, broadcast application is going to be fine for nitrogen because when nitrogen is converted to nitrate, the entire rooting zone is going to be explored by that plant. And so the positioning isn't as important. But remember that when we're talking about mass flow movement, leaching fits into that category as well. And so the potential is there to have movement down through the root profile outside of the rooting zone and then no longer available for a plant. Now, quite often people overestimate the potential for leaching. Leaching can only occur if there's more water in the soil system than what it can hold against gravity. Uh, what we call usually field capacity. And it takes quite a bit of water to reach field capacity and through most of the summer our soils don't exceed it. But there are times in the spring where it might and we could lose it. If we can apply a little bit later, the chance of loss out of the root zone is less and the chance of getting it where we want it in the crop is greater. John, this has been great. So appreciative of you for making time for the Soil School. Great to have you on Real Agriculture. Thank you for having me, Bernard. And this type of information is important. Stuff we've known forever, but I consider this to be part of our site-specific strategy, making sure we've got everything done right on a particular site.